All right, so kind of transitioning away from classes and abstract classes, we're now going to start taking a look at interfaces. So an interface could be described as a class that only consists of abstract methods. So interfaces similar to abstract classes cannot be instantiated for the exact same reason. Uh, if you were to try to actually cr uh, construct an object with an interface, uh, you still have these abstract methods. They have no implementation. So what exactly is going to happen if you try to call one of those methods? So instead, interfaces must be implemented by classes. Or as we'll see a little bit later, uh, we can follow the same sort of process where we can at the very least create reference variables and then uh, construct objects of any of these classes that implement that interface. So before we get into all of that, we'll kind of go through a um, bit more of a breakdown of precisely what an interface is. Uh, so the relationship between a class and an interface is uh, going to be indicated with the implements keyword within what we would refer to as the subclass. So essentially any class that wants to implement those abstract methods will indicate as such in their method header. So right here we see this example public interface shape. Uh, for this example, I kept it fairly simple. We have just a single abstract method in it. So we've got this public ac uh, abstract double get area. And then inside of this rectangle class, we're going to tell it to implement the shape interface. And then we'll go ahead and put together um, some code to implement that abstract method, as well as include anything else within the body of that rectangle class. So there is a particular analogy for describing the relationship between interfaces and classes. You would say that an interface is like a contract and that classes must implement all methods of the interface. So to kind of give you more of a breakdown of what that means, uh, classes implementing the interface must adhere to the contract outlined by the method headers within the interface. So that means, using this one as an example, uh, if we're going to create a get area method, uh, we must include that method inside of the rectangle class. And that method uh, must not take any arguments, so it has no parameters, and it must return a double. So there are certain specifications that are provided with that method header that the rectangle class must adhere to. So the contract specifies the method names, the data types of parameters, and the return types of the methods but the contract does not specify what the methods should actually do. So it doesn't say anything about the implementation details. It's primarily just telling you what are the inputs and what are the outputs. Uh, so overall, when we talk about this relationship, this contractual binding between an interface and classes is what is known as interface inheritance. So this is a very particular kind of inheritance, specifically whenever you're dealing with interfaces. Uh, this next little part is kind of breaking down some of the other rules or the constraints that come with using an interface. If you include any fields in your interface, those fields must be final and static. So that means that all of the fields are treated as constants. And because they're static, that means that those fields would belong to the interface itself. Uh, since, of course, you can't create objects using the interface. So naturally, it would make sense that everything must be static. Uh, so in some cases, after writing the code for an interface, you might encounter situations where you need to add some extra methods to it, but the implementation of those methods would be shared among all of the classes that implement that interface. So a convenient workaround for this would be to use what are known as default methods, which help to kind of address this design concern. So you can see an example here where essentially all you do is add that default keyword to the method header. So you'd say something like public default void display. Uh, in this case, we're just creating a simple example method uh, that's just going to print out a statement right here. And so the assumption here is that you have maybe half a dozen or possibly even say a dozen classes that are all implementing this interface. And for all of those classes, they would be making use out of whatever this method is in the exact same way. So they would just have the exact same implementation. So rather than going in and just adding this method to all of those classes, which gets very repetitive, uh, instead you can just go ahead and create a single default method within the interface itself. And then that just kind of, uh, through inheritance, is uh, capable, capable of being used by all of those different classes. 
So then if we get into the design aspects of interfaces in our UML class diagrams, interfaces are specified using this little interface notation. So there's a little extra annotation that comes with the section for the class name in your class diagrams. Uh, similar to abstract, method, or abstract classes, the name and methods are gonna be italicized. The relationship between a class and an interface is shown with a dash arrow and an open arrowhead. So you can kind of see that between rectangle and the shape interface. So in this example given, I've gone ahead and just removed the extra sections. Only the name section is gonna be included to kind of simplify the diagram. So the primary things that I wanna show here uh, that are unique to interfaces are that additional annotation in the uh, name section and then the, uh, the arrow that's used to show the relationship between your uh, class and the interface that that class is going to implement. And then one last thing to mention for the conceptual aspect of interfaces. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, interfaces cannot be instantiated, meaning that objects cannot be made using the interface. However, you can go ahead and declare reference variables for the interface. And then through polymorphism, you can go ahead and uh, create objects or construct objects of the classes that implement that interface and then have the reference variables reference those objects. So it's very similar to what you see for abstract classes where any class, uh, any subclass of that abstract class can be, uh, you can go ahead and construct an object of that and then use a reference variable for the abstract class to reference those objects. You see the same thing here. So given all of this conceptual explanation of interfaces. We'll now go ahead and take a look at an example that has been put together already that's going to show two different cases for essentially the same application. The first example is gonna show what that application looks like without using an interface. And then the second example is gonna show that with an interface. So we can kind of see what the primary purpose of interfaces is and why it is that you would even include these in your programs. So go ahead and minimize this. Come over to NetBeans. So the two projects that I have right now, one of these is farm management and the other is gonna be polymorphic farm. So this farm management is gonna be without an interface and then polymorphic farm is gonna be with an interface. So we'll go ahead and open this one up first. So come over to source packages, we'll open up the one package I've included for this, which consists of all of the uh, different class files. So the first one we want to start with is going to be farm.java. This one holds the main method. So this is kind of the, um, the central hub of this application. So we've got our package declaration at the top. Underneath there, we've got two imports for an array list and a scanner. As we'll see in a moment, the array list is to hold collections of the different types of animals that we want to put on this farm. The scanner is going to be used to accept user input to specify what kinds of animals we want to add to this farm. Uh, we've got our class header. So in this case, we're not dealing with any kind of inheritance re relationship with the farm class. Uh, we've got our main method, and inside of this main method, if we kind of take a look through here, so we've got a few different array lists, one for each of the different kinds of animals that we can add. So for this particular example, I've included five. So we have chickens, cows, horses, pigs, and sheep. I then include a declaration for the different um, for each one of those different classes, so we've got a reference variable for say the chicken class, cow class, horse class, pig class, and sheep class. Uh, essentially what this is going to do is just add an extra step for whenever we wanna go ahead and construct one of those objects and then add that to our array list. Alternatively, you could just go ahead and construct the object and add it to the list all at once. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and do it this way just so we can kind of break up the individual steps to see each different piece as we go through this. Uh, we'll then go ahead and create a string for the user's input. So we're going to be using this to capture whatever their input is to determine which animal they want to add to the farm. We'll go ahead and create a keyboard so that we can actually wait and scan for their input. Uh, we've included a while loop right here. So this while loop is basically just going to make sure that the program is continuously running until the user tells the program to stop running. Uh, so the keyword that we're going to be looking for is end. That's going to essentially be like our sentinel value that tells us when we wanna go ahead and terminate this part of the program where we're inputting animals to add to the farm. We then have our print statement right here. 
So just go ahead and make that request to the user to please enter an animal to add to the farm. We'll go ahead and capture the user's input right here. And for this particular case, since we've got five different um, items or five different animals we could add, and each one of them is pretty similar in how we're going to go about doing that, we're just going to construct an object and then add it to the array list. Uh, I went ahead and used a switch on the user's input. And then for each one of those cases, uh, we have two different conditions. We could do it uh, with the name, either having an uppercase or lowercase first letter. Um, alternatively, you could just go ahead and take the user's input and then convert that to being an all lower case. Then you only need a single case for each one of these. Again, it kind of depends on precisely how you want to approach that particular step. Uh, so in this case, we've got uh, two different cases for chicken, two different cases for cow, and then horse, pig, sheep, and then two different cases for n, which just hits a breakpoint. Uh, so that then essentially it just loops back to the top. And then based on this condition that we have right here, it will say that we want to go ahead and end it, and then it exits the while loop. And then for the defaults, if they fail to give us an appropriate name for an animal to add, we'll just go ahead and print out a little statement right here, reminding them that animals will include things like chickens, cows, horses, pigs, and sheep. And then once we're done with that, then we can go ahead and just print out the contents of each one of those different array lists. So in this case, we just go ahead and grab everything from each one of those five array lists that are created at the beginning of the program. So the chicken array list, the cow array list, so on and so forth. Uh, we'll go ahead and grab those contents and then print those to the console. Uh, so that's done with the enhanced for loop or the for each loop plus these print statements right here. And then underneath each one of those print statements, we also make a call to a method for those objects. So if we go ahead and take a look at the different classes in addition to farm, we can see that part as well. So we're going to open up one of these. And so for each one of these different animal classes, they're all going to have pretty much the same code inside of them. So they're going to include a name and then some kind of static field to keep track of the number of instances of that animal that we've created or constructed. Uh, we have got a no args constructor to go ahead and construct those objects. That's just going to increment that static variable, that static field for the counter, and then just go ahead and use that as part of the name. So essentially what this means is that when we create our first chicken, we add that to our uh, farm, that will be chicken one. If we go ahead and add another one, that will be chicken two, and then so on and so forth. Uh, we can then go ahead and see each one of those methods that we're going to be calling. So that's going to include things like this cluck method for the chicken. So you can see that one right here. And then for each one of the other four animals, they'll have a similar method for the kind of sound that that animal makes. And then finally, we have the toString method. And so this is just going to print out, essentially just print out the name of that particular object. And so that's what's being used whenever we do these print statements right here, where we're printing out the objects that we're getting from those array lists. So if we go ahead and just run this farm that we have right here, so we can run this file. It expands output window so we can see everything. So right here, it's going to ask us to enter an animal to add to the farm. So let's say that for this particular one, we want to go ahead and just add just a couple of animals for now, we'll kind of test out a few of them and see the, the contents of those array lists when they're printed out at the very end. Uh, so let's say for this very simple example, we'll have something like maybe two chickens, a cow, and a horse. So we can go ahead and put chicken in all our case, push enter. So it went ahead and added that to the farm. Uh, we can go ahead and add the second chicken. We can do this with a capital C. That would also be just fine because we have those two different cases to capture that. Uh, we can then go ahead and add a cow and then a horse. And then if we go ahead and type in end, this will go ahead and terminate the program so that it can go ahead and move on to the second half and then just finish up. So we push end. And then it will go ahead and just print out uh, this is chicken one, chicken two, cow one, horse one. So that's the four animals that I added to this. And then in addition to that, it will go ahead and print out the sound that each one of those makes by calling the appropriate method for each one of them. So kind of like when we call the cluck method for a chicken, we can see that right here. All it's going to do is just print that out to the console. So we see that for the three different animals that we added here. Okay, so that'll cover everything for the 
version of this program that does not use an interface. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the version that does use an interface. So for that one, we'll go ahead and close out each one of these. Let's go ahead and minimize everything from our farm management project. Let's go ahead and open up the polymorphic farm. So inside of the polymorphic farm, we will again still see we've got a couple of different classes for animal, chicken, cow, horse, uh, for chicken, cow, horse, pig, and sheep. In addition, we've got animal.java right here. So let's go ahead and open that one up. And so we see right here for this animal file, this is going to be public interface animal. So instead of being a Java class, this will be a Java interface. We can then see the different methods for it. So we see we've got a make noise method right here. And we also specify that we need to have a two string method. Uh, this is just a guarantee that it will always give us the, um, uh, the two string method, essentially making sure that that's always being implemented in those classes by forcing it to adhere to that interface inheritance, that contractual binding that we talked about. In addition to that, we can also see an example of a default method. So we see right here, we've got this public default void print message. And then inside of that one, we just say this is a default method. Uh, basically, what this is going to do is now just make sure that every one of those classes has this default method. So they could go ahead and access that if they need to. So let's say now we go ahead and take a look at one of these other animal classes that we have. So let's go ahead and open up something like uh, chicken. So if we take a look at the code inside of chicken, uh, the first thing we'll notice for the class header, it will now implement the animal interface. So we've got implements animal in the method header. Uh, so in this way, we're now guaranteeing that they have that relationship between them, that interface inheritance. So now, if we're going to use any of the methods, uh, or include any kind of methods inside of chicken, we must include the two methods that are specified in the animal interface. So we have to include make noise and we have to include some implementation of toString. Uh, from there, most of the rest of this will look exactly the same. Uh, we still got a string and an uh, instance field for the number of chickens. Uh, we go ahead and increment that and then assign that to name. So again, we can still go ahead and get chicken one, chicken two, so on and so forth as we construct those objects. Uh, the next thing that's going to be different is that now Instead of including a method called cluck, we're going to include a method called make noise. That's going to be related to the abstract. So just the definition that we included for make noise right here. Uh, one thing to note about creating these abstract methods, you'll notice that I didn't use the abstract keyword for these. Uh, the reason that I didn't do that is because of the fact that uh, if we don't include something like abstract or maybe something like default, then the assumption that is going to be made if you're including a method inside of an interface is that that method must be abstract. That is, uh, we'll say a good 99 times out of 100, that is the primary purpose of putting a method inside of an interface is that you want it to be abstract. So that particular part of it is just going to be implied with this code. So we see we've got our make noise method right here. So that's what we're going to go ahead and implement. And then we've also got our two string. Again, because we included that in our animal interface, we must include some implementation of it here. And then if we go ahead and take a look at one of these other ones, say like a cow, for example, uh, then we can go ahead and see the same thing. So we see that we've got our name, our uh, instance field, kind of letting us know how many instances of cow objects we've created. We see the same configuration for uh, setting up the name of each one of our animals. You'll see that this one also has that make noise method as well as a two string method. So one of the first things to note about this, because of the fact that we're relying on uh, this interface inheritance, we now have a little bit more uh, uniformity between our different classes. Every one of those classes is going to have the exact same methods uh, with a slight exception to the constructor since that's unique to each class. Uh, but otherwise, they all have a make noise method and a two string method, whereas in the previous version, the name of that method would be different for each one of those classes. So because it's different, because we don't have that little bit of uniformity to it, it can be a little bit easier to forget to include that. But of course, the other thing that helps to guarantee that we're not going to forget it is that if we accidentally leave one of these out, like say if I comment this out and I go ahead and save this, well, now I'm going to get an error for this. If I check right here, 
it's going to tell me that cow is not abstract and does not override the abstract method make noise an animal. So in this way, because of these errors that I'm getting, this is how I know that I'm not adhering to that contractual obligation that I have to implement all of the methods from the animal interface. So what I need to go ahead and do is make sure that I have implemented every one of those methods. Uh, this particular case is pretty easy to fix. Just need to uncomment this implementation of make noise, and then we resolve that error. And so then if we come over to farm.java, take a look at our farm class. So again, uh, most of this code will look exactly the same. There are a few things to note about it that we've managed to kind of clean up or uh, shorten a little bit. Uh, the first thing at the very beginning here, we can go ahead and create an array list of animals instead of five individual array lists for each one of the different types of animals that we want to add to our farm. So in this way, uh, by relying on polymorphism, so when we get into our different cases, uh, now we can go ahead and shorten that down to just using a single array list instead of multiple array lists. So that kind of helps to clean up the code a little bit there, make it more concise. Uh, we can also go ahead and create just a single animal object. Again, that's primarily just relying on uh, polymorphism so that we can go ahead and just assign any one of these different classes to that animal uh, reference variable. We'll go ahead and still set up our user input, our scanner. We'll still have our while loop, which is checking to see when the user enters the word end. We still have this request from the user to go ahead and uh, enter an animal to add to the farm. We'll capture that input and just use the switch to check for uh, what their input was. And then for each one of these, uh, again, I have my cases for either a lowercase or uppercase letter. And then inside of each one of these cases, we will just include a single line besides the break, which is going to construct an object of the particular class that we're specifying. We'll go ahead and assign that to that animal reference variable. And then as we come down to the end of this, Uh, right here at the very bottom after our switch, so after the switch right here, uh, we're going to have this if statement where we're going to check to make sure that the animal is an instance of the animal interface. So essentially any class that implements animal will meet this requirement. Uh, the reason that we have this check is just for the default case. Uh, we want to make sure that if the user fails to enter something that actually matches with being an animal object, we uh, go ahead and don't actually assign any object to that. So we'll just go ahead and set that to null right there. Uh, and then the other thing we can go ahead and do is just check to make sure that the user's input uh, is not the word end. Uh, because if they give us the word end, then we want to go ahead and just uh, terminate the program. So we don't want to do anything with that either. And so then if it meets all of those conditions, then we'll go ahead and take the object that they just gave us and add that to our animals array list. So of course, one of the things that comes with this, in addition to making the code more concise in most places, there is also the expectation that some of it will be a little more complex, say like line 53 right here is an example. Um, so there's a little bit of a trade-off that has to be considered with this as well. And then finally, once we've finished with our uh, while loop up there, we'll go ahead and create a single for each loop for this. So we've gone ahead and shortened this down as well because of the fact that the animal array list is the only one that we're concerned with. Uh, so for this one, we'll go ahead and step through that array list. We'll get each one of the animal objects that we added to it. We'll use a print statement here to go ahead and print those out, keeping in mind that they all have a two string method that's going to get implicitly called by this line. We'll then go ahead and include this call to the make noise method for each one of them. So again, because of this uniformity, we can go ahead and rely on just the single method call and it doesn't really matter which of those animals we're referring to, they all have that same method in them. And then finally to go ahead and demonstrate the default method that we created in our animal interface and actually implemented in that interface, uh, we'll also go ahead and include a call to print message here. So uh, we could go ahead and do this once without this being included. So save that and then run it. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we want to go ahead and use polymorphic farm. And for this one, let's say we want to go ahead and just add one 
and we'll do this for right now just to demonstrate it without a call to the default methods. We'll add just a single sheep to it and then end. And so then we can go ahead and see if this is sheep one and then we go ahead and print out the contents from its make noise method. Uh, we can go ahead and run this again. And maybe for this one, we go ahead and add a horse to this and click end. And for this one, we'll see this is horse one and then printing out the contents of its make noise method. And then if we want to go ahead and take a look at that default method as well, so we'll uncomment this line, save that, and then run it again. And so now let's say we want to go ahead and use the same example I used previously, where we would add something like two chickens. Um, let's say for this one, we want to add something like two chickens, a cow, and a pig this time. So we can do two chickens, a cow, and a pig. And then we'll go ahead and end this. And then if we take a look at all of the contents, so we see this is chicken one, and then we see it print out the noise that that chicken's going to make. And then we'll see this is a default method. So you'll see that for each one of them since we're gonna go ahead and print that out for every single object and all of those objects, um, the classes of those objects all inherit the default method. So we'll see chicken one, chicken two, and then cow one and pig one. See the default method. And you also see the different noises that each one of those animals make. Okay, so at this point, this will wrap up everything for interfaces, taking a moment to go through a lot of the different conceptual aspects of uh, putting together interfaces and actually using them, and then seeing more practically how to actually write out an application that takes advantage of some of the benefits of including an interface in your program, such as the uh, interface inheritance, so that contractual binding, and this idea of uniformity to kind of uh, make your code more concise and in a lot of cases more readable. Um, so going forward for the next couple of videos, what we're going to start taking a look at now is going to be some of the other different ways that we can go about implementing uh, things like uh, typically abstract classes and interfaces. Uh, the primary focus for the next couple of videos is going to be the different ways we can implement interfaces specifically. So that's going to include things like private interclasses, uh, anonymous interclasses, and Lambda expressions. So we'll start to see that as we go through the next couple of videos.